Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with veteran L.A.-based jazz guitarist and composer Grant Geisman. He opened up about his latest 2022 CD called Blues. It's a collection of 12 original blues and jazz songs performed by his stellar supporting cast of musicians. He was born in Berkeley, California and grew up in San Jose and at 11 years old he began his first guitar lesson. After his move to L.A. in 73, he began playing with Gerald Wilson's big band and with Louis Bell. Olsen's big band. Since then, he's had quite a career in music that goes for his personal projects along with TV and film projects. He co-wrote music for all six seasons of Mike and Molly and all 12 seasons of Two and a Half Men. Dig this interview. Good. Hey, thanks for taking a minute of that. I appreciate it. Oh, happy to do it. Before we get into your latest album, Blues, I want to know, how did you survive COVID as a recording artist, as a performer, as you know, a creative person? How did you survive that two-year period, and how did it change you now that we're kind of coming out of it? Well, it was weird not being able to, you know, play with people very much, you know, over those couple of years. That was very odd, <laughs> to say the least, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, professionally, I kind of lucked out in that I was co-writing music for the first season of this TV show called Be Positive <clears throat> on CBS. You know, so that sort of got me over the financial hump. But even that was weird because I never met any of the people. It was all through Zoom. You know, you'd send your stuff in and then you'd have a Zoom conference call and stuff like that. So it was, you know, strange time for sure. Yeah, it was bizarre. Does it feel relieving now to have an album out with the prospect of performing live and all of those things that you were used to before COVID yeah, happened? Very much. And even re just recording the album you know, felt like a big release because it's like, hey, it's a bunch of guys playing together in a studio. You know, this is <laughs> this never happened. You know, it was um, <laughs> cathartic for sure. It almost seems like coming out of this, I know even here in Kansas City, I've been going to a lot of shows, like PTSD, just to be able to go back to normal life. It's kind of a weird, ironic twist of things because I think for a while we thought, all right, well, we're getting out of it and then there's a variant and the chain got pulled again. It's like, we aren't really quite sure because it's not just that we went through a pandemic it's we went we went through so many false alarms exactly yeah yeah so you never knew it was like the sand was shifting under your feet constantly you know so talk to me about the album talk to me about blues how did how did this album come about how did you artistically construct this project well i've been kind of thinking about doing this for i don't know probably five or six years um so i was kind of salting away tunes little by little um, although some of them I wrote right at the very end of the project. Um, but I just kind of had it in mind to do this. And kind of the germation of it really was I'd been hanging out for quite a few years at Norman's Rare Guitars, <laughs> um, you know, here in, in uh, the L.A. area. And he has incredible vintage instruments, and I bought a lot of guitars from Norm. And, and everybody that goes in there is kind of playing like pretty much bluesy kind of stuff, you know. So I just started thinking, hey, it would be cool. Thank you for your call. Oops, and it would be cool to, um, you know, maybe do an album that's more bluesy and a little more guitar oriented. So that was kind of the basic idea. What are you hoping ultimately the listener gets from this album? Well, <laughs> just you know, twelve tunes that are all kind of bluesy in some way, but aren't necessarily you know straight up blues structures. There's a couple tunes that, you know, are bluesy, but very substantially from what you would normally consider as, like, you know, blues chords, which is essentially just, you know, one, four, and five. You know, and then just kind of know where I'm at as a player at this moment. You know, um, it's fun playing bluesy styles. And, and, you know, playing vintage guitars, you sort of play, it makes you play a little bit differently, I think. It was just a fun project to do, a fun project to write. And I hope it's a really fun project to listen to. You're originally from Berkeley. You started playing early, and I just I, I've noticed with that Kansas City connection that you were connected to Jerry Hahn. I was born in Berkeley, but I you know grew up in San Jose, which is you know a little further, I guess, south of you know it's like about I don't know hour away from San Francisco. So when I was about a senior in high school, my mom actually saw this ad in the San Francisco Chronicle, I think it was, that Jerry Hahn was giving guitar lessons. And it, and so we called him up, and he's... So, long story short, I started driving up every Saturday when I was a senior in high school 
from San Jose across the Golden Gate Bridge up into Marin County where Jerry was living. And I studied with him for maybe about a year and a half. And he just, you know, opened my mind to all kinds of stuff. I had never heard Charlie Parker before studying with Jerry. I really had never heard Coltrane. You know, most of my jazz experience was playing in, like, you know, big bands in high school and stuff like that. So apart from just Jerry being an incredible teacher, he also opened my ears to all kinds of stuff. So, um, yeah, you know, certainly I wouldn't be where I am without Jerry Hahn. You know, he's kind of a local legend here. One of the last things I did before the world shut down in early March 2020, March 4, Bill Frizzell came to town, and um, I I just got married the year before, and, and my wife really got into jazz with me and never really knew about it. She was like, what's the, what's the Bill Frizzell show going to be like? And I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> like, I just could not, I, I couldn't, I couldn't pin it down. But at the end of the show, there was a question and answer, and at one point, I think Jerry was there, and maybe it said something. I know his health has been sketchy lately. But the reverence in that room, because there was musicians and all kinds of people that were wanting a minute, and the reverence, and I think Bill specifically pulled him out and said, I owe a lot to Jerry, and the, the room just lit up. And it was, um, I just remembered that, because I always remember that show, because it was one of the last things I saw before the pandemic. But Jerry really did get uh, quite an ovation from everybody there, and he really is revered here as one of the, you know, the guitar gods up there with probably Pat Bettany, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, I think any, virtually anyone that's ever studied with Jerry owes him a tremendous debt of gratitude, you know? So I think that's what you were seeing in that room. Did you always think that you were going to be a guitar player, or did you have other dreams? No, I pretty much always thought I'd be a guitar player. I tell this story, but I think it was like maybe in eighth grade, they have one of those career day things. And I had already been playing guitar for a few years, you know, and playing in little garage bands and stuff like that. So they had this career day, and I came home and I said to my mom, you know, they had this career day and they were showing various occupations, and I have absolutely no idea what what I would want to do based on those things. And she goes, well, you like to play guitar, why don't you do that? And I was like, what? <laughs> you know, I was like, you mean you can earn money playing guitar? You could, you, could, I could do that? And she's like, yeah, you know. I'm like, okay, that's it then. It's usually the opposite. The parents are like, no, you can't make money doing that. So you got, you got, the, the script got flipped. I know, totally. You know, she goes, <laughs> I, you know, you could be on a cruise ship. I mean, you know, she was just thrown. So you could be on a cruise ship playing. You could play in the, the pit orchestra at the, you know, current theater in San Francisco. So there's all kinds of stuff you could do. And I'm like, okay, well, then that's what I'm going to do. So what did she do for a living? Oh, she did many things. She was kind of a dabbler, um, for a while, she ran like um, kind of like Asian furniture stores, and and you know she worked retail. She did all kinds of stuff. She also helped people kind of redecorate their houses, even though she had no, you know, uh, official training or anything. But people would ask her stuff because she worked in furniture stores, and and um, you know she was just a very creative person. So and there was kind of music in the family, but nobody had really done it professionally. Like my grandfather played uh, like four-string sort of Eddie Peabody style banjo. My grandmother, I, I never heard her play because she stopped playing by the time I came along, but apparently she played good ragtime piano like back in the 1920s and stuff. So, And then my father was actually um, a drummer before World War II. And so there was music running through the family, but no one really had you know pursued it all the way. So when I look at your timeline, around 73, you go to L.A., you go to Cal State, but then you hook up with Louis Bellson and Gerald Wilson. Is that when things really started taking off for you? Yeah, it was kind of little by little. And, you know, and truthfully, the whole reason I wanted to go to Cal State Northridge is because it was close to the Hollywood scene. And it was cool because people like Louis Bellson would come and sit in with the jazz band and maybe bring charts in and have the band play them so he could hear them and stuff like that. And because of that, um, you know, he would, he heard me in the thing, Louis did, and also Gerald Wilson heard me um, in that setting. And so that's how I started playing in both of their bands. You know, and just incredible, incredible experience for a college kid to play with these, you know, legends, really. So, yeah, it was like a little by little thing. And then, um, you know, I was playing around town and doing various little gigs and still going to college. 
I think it was around November of 1976, the phone rings, and I pick it up, and he goes, is Grant there? I go, yeah, this is Grant. He goes, hi, this is Chuck Mangione. I'm like, hi, you know. <laughs> and um, <laughs> he had hired me for um, like a one-off date at the Santa Monica Civic that he was doing with his band and then supplemented by some kind of, you know, horn players. And I don't think there was strings on that one. But um, anyway, he liked what I did, and he said, well, I got this little mini tour of the Pacific Northwest you know, do you want to do it? It's like, I don't know, four or five dates up to Seattle and Portland and stuff like that, just with his small band. He was looking to add a guitar at the time. And I said, sure. And, you know, one thing led to another, and he asked me to join his band, and I waved Cal State Northridge a fond farewell <laughs> and went on the road with Chuck. So, What did you learn from, you know, Chuck and Gerald and Louis? What, when you were at that point in your life, you know, very malleable, what was it that you learned from the legends that, that reverberates to today that you teach younger players that you get around? I think it really it was just the joy of playing that came from all of those people, you know. Chuck, um, he, you know, he's got a tune called Give It All You Got, and that was really his philosophy, I came to understand. Like, you know, he would go out there, and sometimes his chops didn't feel great, and a flugelhorn is not all that forgiving an instrument to begin with. Um, you know, but on certain nights he went, might struggle a little bit, but he didn't care. He would just literally give it all he got, you know. And Louis would do the same thing, you know, he always play these incredible drum solos. And and Gerald, you know, he, he always wanted to have a band. And, you know, it was just very inspiring, just the, the joy and love of performing and playing music. So, you know, that totally rubbed off. When you look back on your career and you think about all the stages and places that you've been, what was the first stage you stepped on where you thought, wow, I've arrived at, at, at a certain place that I never imagined, and it was just kind of a nirvana moment? Huh. I, you know, it's kind of weird. I never have ever felt like I've arrived. <laughs> In some ways, mm. I feel like I'm just starting out, you know. But, you know, certainly there were highlights, great highlights, um, one of the ones I mentioned is when we did um, the Hollywood Bowl with Chuck Mangione. It was right after Feel So Good was a hit. And then that next summer, he booked a date at, at the Hollywood Bowl. And they recorded it for a live album with strings and brass. And and uh, he actually sold out the bowl. So you're there with 18,000 people cheering everybody on. And, you know, that was a high point. And then later I did, um, much years later, I did a, a little tour with Burt Bacharach and Elvis Costello, when they had done the Painted From Memory album, they wrote an album together called Painted From Memory. So I was on that little tour. And again, both of those guys, you know, had an incredible work ethic and an incredible love of music, you know. It's just this thread that keeps going through. Like, the people that are really inspiring are, are the people that just want to keep on doing it. The one thing that I find interesting about your timeline is, is how many shows that you were on, just being affiliated with that Hollywood scene. And I think how vital it is that that happened because it really did, even with The Tonight Show and with Doc and all of that, like it really did put jazz in the mainstream. It really put it in the forefront. Did you ever feel like that That was kind of a, a, a not, not a, it wasn't an agenda that came right out, but it was something by proxy that really gave people an appreciation for the jazz arts that may not otherwise. I think that's 100% true. And I think it was by design, because Johnny Carson was a jazz fan. He and Buddy Rich were buddies at a certain point. Um, you know, and I think Johnny wanted to have that Tonight Show big band there and, <clears throat> and have charts written for it and all of that. You know, and then you see, you see things scale down as various other hosts come in. You know, there was a much smaller band when Jay Leno came in, and it wasn't particularly jazz-oriented. You know, and then now a lot of the shows don't even have band. So, you know, certainly it was a special time with regard to presenting, you know, different kinds of music and, and certainly, you know, big band jazz, having that be on TV five nights a week. You know, that that doesn't count for nothing, you know. You've been doing this for a while, and I'm curious, what is it that you love the best? about being a professional musician? What is it that you look forward to every day in this process? 
You know, there's just something cathartic about playing with other people and, you know, bringing music alive. You certainly do that when you do a like a recording session, you know, paper, and you have to play those dots correctly. But then you also try to bring something extra to the music every time. You know, that's part of what being a session musician is. And in, certainly you try to do, to do that live, do that same thing, and then kind of broadcast that out to an audience. And you get this, you know, it's like this feedback loop. Um, you know, it's not any big secret, but, you know, playing live is, is uh, there's a lot of energy that gets transferred back and forth between the players and the audience. So, you know, there's something pretty great about that. So if you have a dream tonight and you run into your younger version of yourself, you know, um, in, in the beginning in the 70s, and you could give that version of you a piece of advice based on the wisdom that you gained over all of these years, and this isn't about regret, it's more about dispensing wisdom, what would you tell your younger version? I would tell him just to always have a positive attitude, <clears throat> you know, no matter who you're playing with or, to ma- you know, no matter what the situation is. Um, You know, always try to do your best, always try to, you know, play your best, always try to have a good attitude. It's not always easy to do depending on what the situation is. But, you know, that would really be my number one advice to really anybody. So when you kick back in the easy chair and you think about your career, what is it that you're the proudest of? What what brings you the most joy? I mean, it's it's kind of funny. I I sort of, in, in many ways, kind of did what I set out to do, you know. I mean, I wanted to, you know, play jazz. I wanted to do session work in L.A. I wanted to go on the road, you know. I wanted to be on various TV shows and whatever. I wanted to play on albums. And I wanted to have my own band, and I wanted to, you know, do my own albums. I kind of have done what I set out to do, which is kind of amazing, really. So the one thing that you've been fortunate to, as you just mentioned, is you you perform with a lot of amazing individuals but if you could go back and see somebody in the history of jazz that you never got to see live who would you love to have caught live i mean there's so many but certainly the first guy that comes to mind would be west montgomery i i never saw him live you know that would just be incredible and then you know from there i'd love to see all those guys live i'd love to see coltrane i'd love to see charlie parker you know you know Right before the pandemic happened, I moved to a suburb of Kansas City, Lee Summit, Missouri. And after that happened, I would bring that up, and it's the hometown of Pat Metheny. Everybody has a Pat story. So this has been kind of an offshoot of what I do when I interview uh, musicians. Do you have a Pat story? I I have a Pat story, but it's not my story. (laughs) Um, You know, I, I played on TV shows for Chuck Lorre you know, the big kind of sitcom guru. We did Two and a Half yeah. Men and Mike and Molly. And so apparently, you know, Chuck Lorre actually wanted to be like a songwriter, a guitar player, and he was studying at the University of Miami at that time. He was living down there. And he said, you know, one day this quote-unquote visiting professor, and he describes him as somebody that looked like a 16-year-old kid walks in <laughs> to to teach a class. And... um you know, just plays this incredibly burning stuff, just, you know, insane. And Chuck Laurie says, right then and there, he goes, I need to find a different career. (laughs) (laughs) And that mystery man was Mr. Pat Metheny. Correct. You know, they wrote a book, somebody here, Carolyn Glenn Brewer, she's a local author, and she kind of delves into Kansas City history, wrote about his early days like how he got started, and it's amazing. I mean, his old mantra was play as much as possible and learn as much as you can. And whenever I hear people talk about him, they talk about how cool and gracious he is, how much of his time he dispenses, and how he really does kind of, I mean, now that he's where he's at in his life, he probably doesn't have to play as much, but he's pretty consistent with live shows. So I always find that fascinating about, you know, just, the lore of somebody that came from Kansas City that's really, you know, um, as well, well respected as he is. Yeah, I was in Kansas City not too long ago, and I went through the um, the jazz museum they have there, which is really cool. Um, yeah. And they actually have Charlie Parker's horn that he played at Massey Hall. I was like, wow, that, this weird yeah. little kind of semi-plastic horn, you know, part of it's made out of Bakelite or something. Yeah. Anyway, 
Yes. So yeah, and you know, an incredible hist- amount of history coming out of Kansas City for sure. You know, and you know, I never realized until a few years ago that that Massey Hall show was poorly attended because there was a major boxing match going on that night. Oh, I, d- I didn't know. If, I don't know if I ever heard that. I'm just happy it yeah. got recorded, you know. But yeah, right. And that's the thing. People always talk about that's the seminal jazz show that goes down in the annals of recorded history, but it was poorly attended. I'm like, that can't be true. It's Massey Hall, and it was like, I can't remember what the boxing match was, but it took everybody's attention that night. It was <laughs> that's really um, interesting. Wow. Yeah, it is. It is. History is just absolutely fascinating. Um, but you know, the interesting and, and I, thing is sometimes you, if there's nobody in the audience. Then you play the best show ever because yeah, you're kind of just playing for yourself, you know. Yeah, it's a it's yeah. a weird thing that can happen sometimes. Well, and it's wild how we get these memories of things stuck in our head, and it's kind of crystalline. And the older we get, sometimes we realize things. Like I literally, it's been within six months. I realized on that fateful, fabled game in '86 between the Mets and the Red Sox. Phil Buckner was not supposed to be in that game. There was a regular first baseman, and they only put Buckner in because he was he was an older player. He played all year long, but they would typically take him out in late innings because his knees hurt so bad. But they put him in as a token gesture, and that's the only reason why he was in there and that play went through his legs. Wow. Huh. So yeah. it's weird. <laughs> it say, is. You know, pan out, so to speak. It is, yeah. Um, so, so at the end of the day, everyone has a perception of you, your family, your friends, your fans, but ultimately you live your life. You have a perception of who you are. Who do you think you are? <laughs> who do I think I am? Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I don't know. I, that's really hard. I mean, you know, I guess I'm a lot of things. I'm a guitar player, but, you know, the other thing, I have kind of a side hustle <laughs> There's a tune on blues called Side Hustle. My side hustle is writing books related to Mad Magazine and the EC comics of the 1950s, like Tales from the Crypt and Weird Science and Vault of Horror and all this kind of stuff. So I've written five books related to that, which you know, many people in my music side of things don't even have an idea that I do this. And the, the latest one is published by Tashin, um, who, who do these giant coffee table books and the latest one came out in uh, 2020, and it's called The History of EC Comics. And it's this giant coffee table book that weighs 13 pounds, and it's like 15 inches high. And I wrote it and picked all the images. So, I don't know. That's another thing I do. <laughs> so, there you go. I love it, man. Grant, hey, thank you for opening up about the album and your career. This has been wonderful, man. I appreciate the time. You bet. It was nice talking with you. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Los Angeles, Kansas City, and spots all over the globe, giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to Grant for his time, energy, and cool. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com and for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. I want to tip you off to a wonderful program I found out about. As we expand our reach, we have made some friends out there in the world that love jazz as much as we do. This program is fully endorsed by Neon Jazz. Gerald Albright, Rhea Schneider, Charlie Hunter, Duke Robillard, Sean Jones, Walter Beasley, Steve Swallow. Something Came From Baltimore is a jazz, blues, and R&B podcast and radio show, and it's not really about Baltimore. Subscribe to the podcast and listen to your favorite artist, or feature favorite artist that something came from Baltimore and be a part of that Be More music scene. Joe Lovano, Jeff Coffin, Paula Cole, Denuso Makatani, Ann Passio, Chess Smith, Thumbscrew. Neon Jazz.